All right, it's time to man up. Ugh. Go on. Two. Yo, Kellen. 99. What are you doing, bro? 100. Ugh. Whew. I'm getting ready for the man up show tonight. Kellen, man up is not about hitting the weights. It's about encouraging men to run their race and finish strong. Oh, you mean race? Yes. Oh, give me one second. <laughs> uh, I'm ready now. Yo, bro, you just don't get it. Nah, you don't get it. That don't beat you in this race. See ya. <laughs> well, Kellen doesn't get it, but you can. Man Up is for you. We've got our hard questions panel here tonight to answer all your questions and encourage you to run your race and finish strong. So stay tuned, it's gonna be an amazing night. That had everything except the Rocky theme. That's right? it. <laughs> we had had a Rocky theme, but I think that could have gone big time, big time. We welcome you too to this very special Cornerstone series, Real Answers, Man Up. I'm Don Black, I'm the host, the moderator of our Hard Questions panel, and every time we get these men together, these pastors together, we take on tough questions. But in this program, we're taking on tough questions men face. Men face, so get ready. This is live, you're watching live. We're gonna give you ways to connect. So you can call in, or you can get on the air with us. In this program, you can, you can actually get on the air and, and ask your question live. Or you can text us. Or you can, you can uh, call our, our, our prayer partners. But I'm the moderator, and the panels with me today, on today's panel are... Dr. William R. Glaze from Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh, and I lift real weights. <laughs> 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 Pastor Ray Hypo, Providence Presbyterian Church in Robinson Township. <laughs> Pete Jackaloni from the Rainbow Temple Assembly God Church in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, and I exercise daily. <laughs> <laughs> J. Anthony Gilbert, Kingdom Restoration Christian Center, and I'm all the way up. <laughs> I love the pink way. Did you see the pink way? Mm. <laughs> the little pink way. That was, that was, that was beautiful. <laughs> well, we're glad you've tuned in. It's fun here in the studio, but I, I know we're here to have fun. Yes. But we're also here because this is, this is serious. Mm -hmm. This is serious. Kirk and Kellen Gilbert, they're, they're fun guys, but they're also men that are called by God and are yeah. anointed men in, of God. And they're going to be here throughout the, the whole program. They're the ones that are going to take your questions and pose your questions to here to us, the panel. So we're your panel. You're our hard question source. So get ready. Start calling. I think the phone number may be on the screen already. Start calling the phone number. Start uh, texting the phone number, the questions that you have for us. And don't be shy. Pastors, we don't want them to be shy, no, right? No, no. no. Amen, brother. You know, when we talk about manning up, let's, let me just get started with that. When you say those terms, some people may not really be clear on that. Well, what's it mean to man up? To me, the very first thought I, that comes to my mind is, is um, be responsible. Be res that's a, I mean, that's just a quick 60 second, be responsible. Man up. Well, to be present. You know, a lot of guys in our communities are not present. And so I think to man up means that you're present, even if you don't live mm -hmm. with your children, that, you know, you should be present in their lives. And mm -hmm. I see a whole lot of situations where that's not the case. Man up. I think of Jesus when he was on trial and Pilate says, behold the man. There was only mm -hmm. one man. Mm -hmm. And he is the model man, and that we are called to be that kind of a man. That we can't save the world, but we are called to do what is right in the, with the power that we've been given. We're called to be the kind of husbands that God would have us to be, the kind of fathers that God would have us to be. And with his spirit, we can do that if we man up. That's good. That's good. Man up, Pastor. I would say just a couple of things with that is... Uh, Handle your business. That's what we used to say back in the day. When you tell them to man up, you handle your yeah. business. And that's what men do. Men take care of their business in every area of their life, whether it's spiritually, financially, emotionally, in every area. Well, that's, that's kind of where I was at, too. In, the, in my basketball days, we played zone, and then all of a sudden, you have to, if you had to switch out of zone, you had to go to man, you'd shout out man up, and you'd take, you'd take right. your guy, man and you take your guy, and you go man on man, man one on one. And that's what you're talking about, going one on one and being the man that you're supposed to be, that's right. to, to do what you're supposed to do. Amen. Be a real man is a man that does what he's supposed to do and understands why. Well, I mentioned Kurt and Kellen. Let's go see them now. 
Thanks, Don. And we want you guys to call right now, 877-437-0202. Also, text your questions to Real Answers 77453. Recently, Don Black and our Cornerstone crew attended the Pittsburgh Man Up Conference. Don was able to interview a few notable Pittsburghers to hear their story. Watch this. Brother, you know, you've been, you've been running the race. Yeah. And God's brought you a long way. Yes. Supernatural testimony. Amen. Amen. So I want to hear a little bit about that because there's somebody watching that is stuck. Don, you know, uh, years ago I came to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, I was a Muslim. I uh, grew up in a Muslim home, Turkish Muslim home, immigrated from Turkey when I was two years old uh, with my mom and dad, and I had no idea who Jesus was. I came to the Steelers, and I was a druggie at that time. For 11 years, I was a drug abuser. And, all, and you know, uh, as I was going through all the things, the, the lies of false manhood, you know, I thought that if I just could play college football, that would make me a man. If I could only play in the NFL, that would make me a man. And I remember at every goal that I attained, I felt more and more empty. Mm -hmm. And using drugs and abusing drugs and, and thinking that uh, that was going to find or bring me fulfillment. And I was very empty. I was very shallow. Then I met a bunch of guys who loved Jesus, loved each other, and loved me and told me the good news of the gospel. And you know, Don, and I've told you this before, I fell in love with the body of Christ before the person of Christ. Mm -hmm. Because these guys, John Kolb, who you've interviewed, uh, John Stallworth, Donnie Schell, mm -hmm. Craig Wolfley, Ted Peterson, all these guys that loved Jesus on the Pittsburgh Steelers, there was something about them that was very, very attractive. Something I knew that they had, a sense of purpose, a sense of fulfillment, a sense of de destiny that I didn't have. And I saw it and I wanted it. Mm. And it was only until, it was not until uh, I heard the good news of the gospel, that Jesus loved me, he had a plan for my life, he wanted to forgive me of all my garbage from the past and transform me into a new uh, creation. Pastor, we know that the Lord's hands upon us as we walk forward in his plan. Tell us a little bit of your story, how God's taken you down the path that has brought you to here. Well, I gave my life to Christ as a teenager. My mom uh, gave, came to Christ through the ca uh, Catholic Charismatic Renewal. Mm. Gave her life to Christ and uh, I started walking with God as a teenager. Fell away for a few years. Uh, came back to the Lord in my college years. And uh, from that point forward, just began to follow a call of God on my life. And, uh, and taking one step at a time, Bible school and then serving in a church and then traveling in churches and speaking and then a missionary in Africa. And we started this church here about uh, 25 years ago. Wow. And now so, that's what you just described. You made it sound so easy. <laughs> it wasn't easy. No. It's a hard journey, isn't it? It's a very difficult journey because, you know, the reality of it is, is it's a walk with God. And there's a man side and there's a God side. It's so easy to look at the God side and say, of course, he's amazing. He's wonderful. He's full of grace, kindness, and mercy. But the reason he's full of grace and kindness and mercy is because there is a man side. I think men sometimes can be so brutally hard on themselves mm. and create a picture of what we believe spirituality looks like, and it's different. But I think men need to understand that we're laborers together with God, not for God. For excludes Him. Mm. It says, help bless this so I can bring it to you and you'll like it. Mm. With Him is, what do you want done? Mm. And when I fail, now I come back and say, Lord, you know, this thing we're doing together, I, I, you have an issue. I created it, but you have an issue. Pastor, we, we are vessels that God uses. He moves in us and through us, mm -hmm. and He takes us forward. Tell us about a little bit about your journey and how you've seen God open doors that you couldn't have opened yourself. Well, when I was 19, I said I'd never darken a church door. I had been raised by a family that vividly displayed the Spirit-filled life, but I had accepted the devil's lie that following Jesus meant the end of all fun and joy in life and you just hung around churches and tried to not act too bored. And, and, and so I said, I, I don't want anything to do with it. Fortunately, God wasn't put off by that. And I came to Christ at age 20. I was studying to be a jazz musician at Duquesne University. And God uh, clearly called me to ministry. And that began a pursuit of preparation for that. And then after my first church 35 years ago, God called me to the inner city, to a church that uh, everybody had given up hope on because it was in the north side. 
and it just had a little hunk of property on the corner and the neighborhood was rough and, uh, and friends said, you're crazy to go there, it'll be the end of you. But I knew God had called me. And I think one of the keys to pressing forward after you start in the kingdom is to know what God's call on your life is. To know that it's God's call. That means you don't want to negotiate with it and you don't want to compromise with it because God always takes the best route. So if you negotiate with God, you're negotiating for something less. If you compromise, you're saying, I want to settle for something less. And I have found that if you keep pursuing the Lord and His call on your life, you don't have to ever get bored. Some of you look at your life and they'll go, hey, this guy's got it all together. <laughs> you know, he's at the pinnacle of his career. He is, he's a winner. He's a winner. But you know, I, I know for myself, I got where I am because of the hand of God. Absolutely. Do you share that testimony? There's no question, man. Um, you know, I'm the head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers, but beyond that, you know, I'm a head coach in the NFL. I mean, it's only 32 of these jobs uh, on the planet. Uh, I'm not that good. Uh, none of us are that good. Um, God puts us in these positions for reasons beyond football. And um, I'm very aware of that. I embrace that. I'm comfortable with that. And I try to look for new and different ways to utilize that fl platform that I've been given to help and to help others. Oftentimes, my wife and I joke, you know, we've been obviously very blessed, man. Uh, but there were some bumps along the way, opportunities missed, jobs that I didn't get. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to laugh about those um, because, you know, at the time it seemed like complete devastation. Uh, but the reality is, is that uh, we got to trust in the Lord, man, His plan for us. Um, he chose not to put us in those circumstances or situations uh, for a reason that was eventually revealed to us over the course of time. And I just think uh, more than anything, um, I just try to remain very cognizant of that, man, and, uh, and appreciative of that. Um, and uh, my wife does a great job of reminding me. <laughs> they, they seem to do that really well. Don't they? No doubt. Our wives have a, a uh, good way of reminding us that we kind of have to keep our humil humility down. I, I, uh, I love Coach because he's, he's honest. You know, he'll, he'll tell you what he thinks, and Rock, and, and John, and the pastors that are shaking this part of the, of the nation up. Hey, we've got a caller on the line, live, in, live right now. Jim, you're on the line. Uh, yeah, I was calling. My wife, she's had uh, three affairs. Uh, this third one, she left me, and I'm just wondering, is the force the answer? What should take place with this? because I feel that God has a call in my life, and I want to follow Him. Wow. So I heard you say that your wife has had three different affairs, and uh, she's had to, on a, a fourth, and she's left you? Yes. And you want to know what our, our, uh, our word would be to you, and you have a call on your life. You feel God's got a call on your life? Yes. Pastors? Well, uh, the first thing I would say, and I'm not sure... Uh, if you and your wife have been to counseling. Uh, but, yes. you know, before you make any definitive break, I, I would, you know, go to counseling because, again, you know, what, once you make this decision mm -hmm. and then you continue on with ministry, you know, this is something that would impact your ministry after that. So you want to be clear from God uh, as to what your next instructions are. And I'll say this, even though it says in the Word of God that, you know, when a, a spouse has been unfaithful, that you can uh, have a divorce, that that's not always the first thing that we should seek. Yeah, and, and I agree with what Dr. Glazer said that, Jim, the most important thing for you is to um, seek first the kingdom of God. And, and whatever you do, do not allow, do not allow uh, another woman to come in your life right now. That, I would strongly urge you. you. You're vulnerable, and so whatever you do, don't whatever you do, don't make another, uh, uh, don't make a woman your best friend. Uh, and as and as Doc said, seek professional counseling. Good Christian, it's out there. You, it, it, you'll humble yourself, but in doing that, keeping God first, His call first, uh, those are the first things I would say as far as one, two, three order. You know, Dr. Glaze, you said, you know, it's okay biblically. After the yeah. first one, it yeah. was okay to go. Yeah. But one thing I would say to you is this, is that after the third one, I would ask yourself also, why should I stay? 
and not in a way that you have the right to leave, but if this person keeps stepping out on you, you need to figure out what's going on in this situation. Mm -hmm. So find out why, I don't know all the details of that, but right. find out why she keeps stepping out. Mm -hmm. And then also go, not just say, well, is it okay to go, but why should I stay? What is the reasoning why I need to stay committed in this relationship? Is she giving you anything to work with? Because you have to forgive, but reconciliation and forgiveness are two different things. Mm -hmm. So reconciling, it requires two parties, while forgiveness only requires one party to yeah, do that. Yeah, that's a good word. Yeah, I agree with Jay. Uh, Jim, I think as we've already talked about here on the panel, biblically you have grounds for divorce. Jesus made that clear, that you can divorce someone when they commit sexual immorality. Uh, that is the sin, or Paul talks about desertion. But um, that's, that seems clear. Um, I would, like my brother Jay said, really look at, look at myself too. You know, I've done enough marriage counseling that if your wife has had three affairs, you know, what, what, what was the circumstances for that? You know, what was going on in the dynamic there? You know, are, are you want to look at your, you want to look at your own sin issues. Um, you can't be responsible for someone else's sin, but did you do anything that may have led to that? You know, did you have anything that was in the background there? I mean, you always want to look at yourself first. And then as far as the call, you know, biblically, we understand that there's an internal call and then there's an external call. You know, if you feel the desire, if you see the gifts and you have that desire to, to be a shepherd of God's people, um, that's, a, that's an indication of the internal call. But there also has to be a body of believers that begin to say, I see the Lord's hand in your life. So if you're not plugged into a church, mm. if you're not plugged into other believers, you really can't have that external call. No, nobody wants to take this up himself, the Bible says. No man takes this honor to himself. It has to be conferred. So you have to be plugged into a good church. You have to have other believers mm. in your life. And if they're not seeing God's hand there, then, then it's not there. I mean, if the external call is not there, it can't be there. So I, I'd say get plugged into a church and then look at your own heart, Cry, you know, cry out before the Lord. And then, you know, if it's apparent that, that this is a, a approach you should take, you can divorce your wife. Hey, Jim, you know, this program's called Man Up, and I think that's what you got to do, man. You got to man up. That means, you, to me, what that means to me is you got to decide that this is between you and Jesus. You get one on one with Him, and don't let the threat of a divorce keep you, right. because sometimes, You'll stay in a place because you feel that call on your life. God calls you into ministry, and the threat is if you get divorced that you're not going to be that's qualified. Good. That's good. Well, see, that's a lie. That's, right. that's, that's right. a lie. That's Don't right. be held back and, and accept mm -hmm. what you shouldn't accept because you're afraid that that's going to disqualify God's call in your life. It does not disqualify God's, God's call in your life. He's the one who calls you. He's the one who's going to establish you. And he's the one who's going to lift you up. Now, what, your relationships isn't lift you up. Your wife has gone... I think you said four times. Mm -hmm. So I would say to you, it's time for some separation at least. You've got to get a, you know, at least some clarity mm -hmm. in what's going on in your life. You need to get with the Lord. It's time to man up. Mm -hmm. Time to man up. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad you called. I, it, it took a lot for you to make that phone call. It took a lot of courage. And I applaud you for that courage. That's a great first step Amen. on a pathway mm -hmm to where God wants you to be. He does not want you to be in this place of being pushed down and held down and put into this kind of a mold that doesn't fit you. That's a good step. Thank you for calling us. We enjoy, all of you, everybody that has a question, call us now. Call the number that's on the screen or go to text. You can text your question to us. I wrote a book that is called uh, God's Answers for Real Life. Mm -hmm. Wrote it with 30 different topics in it. Uh, first thing I did when I came to Cornerstone, I want to give you a copy of it. Here's how you get a copy for yourself. How do I save my marriage? What are signs of addiction? Does God love me? Can I be healed? In today's world, it's easy to look for answers, but where do you find the truth? Well, here at Cornerstone, we believe that real answers for all of life's questions come from God's Word. We care about you and want to help you find what you're looking for. And as our gift to you, we would love to send you God's answers for real life. Cornerstone President Don Black's book covers 30 topics from depression to finances to addiction to marriage. Each chapter gives answers from the Bible on whatever you may be facing. So call today or go online for your free copy of God's Answers for Real Life. It will bless you and help you find the abundant life that Jesus promises.
We want to encourage you guys tonight to man up and call 877-437-0202. And you can also text Real Answers to 77453. And Kellen, we actually have our first text now. It reads, how do I become the spiritual leader of my home when leading doesn't come natural to me? Don? How do you become the spiritual leader in your home when leading is not natural? Dr. Glaze. Well, you know, I, I would say this, uh, surround yourself with some good mentors, mm -hmm. you know, some people who lead well. And I'm sure if you're a member of a church, just get around those guys mm -hmm. and, and see what they do. Because if it doesn't come natural to you, that there are men that it does come natural to and that they are very gifted. I, I've been around, you know, guys that, I mean, they just had great relationship with their wives, with their mm -hmm. kids, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and they led. And I, I remember I had a friend that uh, his daughters kept themselves pure. And, and the reason that they kept themselves pure because they didn't want to dishonor their dad in any way because he was such a, you know, such a respected leader. And just being around him, being around him influenced my life and showed me some things about leadership. I, I think the other thing too is, is uh, stay humble. You know, don't, don't try and be what you're not. Uh, stay transparent, stay humble, and follow the life of Christ in the Word. And as you stay transparent, and as you stay humble before your kids, when you make a mistake, hey, be willing to say, hey, I made a mistake. And as, because there's enough advice in this, this good book. There's a nice, to teach you how to be a leader. But the first thing of a leader, he, be, he must be a servant first. There you Amen. go. Be a servant. The rest Amen. will follow. See, I think that's part of the problem, guys, is because we put this term leader out here and, right. we, and we don't define it. And so people start to say, well, I'm not a leader. Mm -hmm. Where in actuality, most Christians are meant to be leaders. Salt and light is leadership, Pastor. We're, we got to redefine the term leader. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, he said, how do I become the spiritual leader? Mm -hmm. And as a man in my life, I think being a leader in my family doesn't mean you call the shots. There you go. Mm -hmm. I believe God spoke this to me and said, if you, I'll only give you as much authority in your family as you're willing to die for. Oh boy. And the job of the spiritual leader of the family is to lay down his life and right. to serve. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve mm -hmm. and to give my life a ransom right. for many. So a lot of times people are trying to be the leader in the family thinking, well, I can just call the shots. I can yeah. do what I want. When really your job <laughs> is to lay down your life for your family and that we need God's help in order to do that. One thing I would add to that is I think the phrase of the question was, how do I become the spiritual leader? If you're a man, you're already the spiritual That's leader. Right. That's right. Yeah, God has that. already, if you're a Christian man, you already have the spirit within you. You are the leader of your house. Leading doesn't mean, you know, being the boss. It means being a servant. It means That's serving good. others. It means That's putting good. others first, as, as you men have already said, but I would just say to this guy, you're already the leader. Mm -hmm. You just need to draw upon the resources that God has Amen. given to you, surround yourself with men, and be the leader God's called you to be. Amen. Well, we've got a live caller on the, on the air. Thomas, you're with us here in the studio. What's your question? Thomas? Uh, I was just saying that um, uh, my daughter, she is gay, and she wanted me to go to her wedding when she married another woman. I wouldn't go because I condone that kind of marriage. And she's not, she doesn't think I should be going to anybody's marriage because I wouldn't go to hers. Mm -hmm. what's, your, what, what's your question, Thomas? Well, what do I do? Do I go to uh, my daughter's wedding? Oh, she, she hasn't been. I, has she been married? Is she already married? Is it, is it coming? Is she, it upcoming? She's married to this woman. Yeah. She got married to a woman. Right. And I was invited to the wedding, but I wouldn't go to it. And did you do, you're asking, did you do the right thing? Yes. I got you. Pastors? A close friend of mine did the exact same thing, the exact same thing, and remained firm to what he believed this and his daughter totally turned around. Today Praise she's God. happily married and it's a, it's a Cinderella God story. So I think in this case, sir, you have to honor your convictions. That's what I would encourage you. You know, uh, so this is what you felt convicted in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Honor that, but don't stop loving your daughter. If Amen. Well, and, and that's what I was <laughs> gonna say. Uh, Pete, just to follow up on what you said that, you know, you have to honor your convictions, yeah. you know, whatever the Lord puts on your heart to do. 
But the worst thing that you can do is alienate yourself right. from your daughter. That you need to find opportunities, and we talked about uh, in the question before, serving. You know, find opportunities to serve your daughter, to mm -hmm. let her know that even though you don't agree with the decision that you made, that you still love her mm -hmm. and that you still will be willing to do whatever it takes, you know, to have that love relationship with her. I, I would just say, Thomas, you absolutely did the right thing because whatever they want to call it, your daughter is not married to another woman. It's not possible. God designed marriage to be between one man and one woman. So our world can call it marriage, but it wasn't marriage. And when we go to a wedding, we're bearing, you know, it's actually we're witnesses. Right. So if you would have gone to that ceremony, you would have borne false witness of God, as hard as that is to say. And so if you really love your daughter, you say to her, honey, I love you too much to go to this lie because that's what it is. It's a lie. And I don't think you ever accept that. You never accept that your daughter's gay. You started your question to us, my daughter's gay. I would just humbly say to you, no, she is not. She's deceived. She's leading a lifestyle that's inherently sinful, that's but she's a woman made in the image of God. And the solution for her is to stop living in sin and to live in obedience to God. So she is a woman, she is made in the image of God and she is not gay. She's living a homosexual lifestyle. That's a sinful lifestyle. You be a bold witness to her. You continue to love her, but you never accept that that's sin. Strong. That's good. Oh, that's very it's good tough work. Love. That's a, that's a good word. That's right out of the word, right out of the scripture. Hey, let's go over to Kurt and Kellen and see what's going on in their area. Hey, guys, this is something special tonight. That's right. You get to talk to the Hard Questions panel live. And get an immediate answer by calling 877-437-0202. You can also text your real, real, text to real answers, 77453. Call us now. The next question reads, my wife wants me to communicate my feelings more. I don't like to share. What do we do? <laughs> oh, wow. Hey, welcome to marriage. <laughs> yeah, right. Should have watched the, last week's Love yeah. 101. Love 101. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do, pastors, when you're not really, your wife wants to hear more and you're kind of not wanting to say more? What's your counsel? Well, I, I would say again, because I'm big on counseling, that you, you need to get with a good biblical Christian counselor mm -hmm. and sit down and let them help you work through mm -hmm. these issues. I mean, you can try to force things. And I think if you try to force it, that your wife is going to see that you're trying to force it and it's not going to work. But if you get in with a good Christian counselor that gets into the word of God, talks about uh, how to communicate mm -hmm. uh, biblically, then that'll open that up and open up your communication. What do they say? A woman speaks how many thousands of words? 40,000. 40,000. <laughs> it's really astronomically high. And a man in comparison is 10% of that. And so as Doc said, we encourage you, sir. We encourage you. Start someplace. Be honest with your wife. Say, sweetheart, uh, I'll try. I'll do my very best. That, and I think any woman would accept that. And uh, st have a starting place. And as Doc said, get some good counsel. But then, you know, begin to talk about what interests your wife. And then uh, that is so romantic. Whatever interests her and you, and you make a point to want to wanna engage in that, I, I think it's a good start. And he also said, in the question, said to communicate my feelings. So I'm hearing a woman that's talking emotion. Mm -hmm. And this man may be coming from a analytical, more of a concrete place. Yeah. Yeah. So you may have to learn to speak a different language. I tell people all the time, my wife and I are like that. I'm very much analytical. My wife is very emotional. And so I have to learn to speak Tiffany. I, that's my wife's name. I can't speak Jay to her because it doesn't communicate to her. I have to speak her language. So one of the things I would say is find out your wife's language and become a student of her language and learn to communicate to her through her language and your love life will go to a whole nother level. Oh man, I love that. I, I totally agree. I, I think what we're seeing here, you know, I would like him to share his feelings with me and I don't want to do that. Well, what do we see? We're seeing the typical <laughs> female and the typical right. male. I mean, right. most women do want to share their feelings and most men don't. And, yeah. you know, so you're having that dynamic right there. And, and I think, you know, Jay, you're absolutely right. I mean, the guy's got to take the lead. This is, when we talked about being the spiritual leader. How do you do that? Well, you humble yourself That's right. and you try to address your wife's feelings. You know, you don't talk to her in Jay language. You don't talk to her like one of your buddies. Yeah. 
You try to, and even though you say, well, you know, why do I have to do this? Because you're supposed to do this because she is the one who needs you to do that, you know, and, and, and you lay down your life first and you do that first. But like uh, my brother said, I think counseling, marriage counseling is great for that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you, you don't wait till your marriage is falling apart to get marriage counseling. That's so right. many couples yeah. come into, you know, they'll come into your office and the yeah. marriage is basically over. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not the time. Right. The time now, right. Is right where you are, hey, yeah. we got this disagreement. Go yeah. and learn because yeah. yeah. marriage is learning. Go and learn how to relate to one another. There's a lot of good Christian information out there. And you know, Doc, they're looking for a magical prayer. If I can only get yeah, yeah. Pastor so and so or Deacon so and so to pray over me, it, it bottom line, it takes discipline. Mm. It takes a lot of discipline, and uh, there'll be a lot of failure in it, but you just don't quit. Well, you know, there's a verse in, in Proverbs that says, uh, "Counsel is is within the heart of an individual, but a man of understanding will draw it out." Oh, no. yeah. So, like you said, it's in there and you have the ability to do it, you just have to you know, work on drawing it out. That's good. You know, um, the whole idea that we have to relate to each other on our own terms is important. Maybe an idea for you to take is find a new hobby you can do together. Together, yeah. Something you don't know how to do and she doesn't know how to do. Maybe it's uh, something as simple as a crossword puzzle. Maybe it's tennis, maybe, I mean, it could be whatever it is. But pick up a new hobby that you can start doing together and have fun together and let that be a place of neutrality in your life so that you have something. So many times we just don't have fun times. And Even maybe, as a bicycle riding. It could be bicycle riding. Terry and I have been riding bikes. So it's, it's important to do things differently. Mm -hmm. Do, do, just shake it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Act as, like the show says, it's time to man up. Mm -hmm. Time to man up. One-on-one, -on -one, guys. Right. Let's take it one-on-one. -on -one. You know, chapter 12 in this book I wrote, it's called uh, God's Answers for Real Life, is, is titled Standing Strong. How do you stand strong in the adversity? And that's what we're really talking about, standing strong. I want to give you a copy of this book for you. It's my gift to you. Here's how you can get it. How do I save my marriage? What are signs of addiction? Does God love me? Can I be healed? In today's world, it's easy to look for answers, but where do you find the truth? Well, here at Cornerstone, we believe that real answers for all of life's questions come from God's Word. We care about you and want to help you find what you're looking for. And as our gift to you, we would love to send you God's answers for real life. Cornerstone President Don Black's book covers 30 topics from depression to finances to addiction to marriage. Each chapter gives answers from the Bible on whatever you may be facing. So call today or go online for your free copy of God's answers for real life. It will bless you and help you find the abundant life that Jesus promises. And it's been great. Remember to call 877-437-0202. Also text Real Answers to 77453. And we've got another question. The question reads, is it okay to share an apartment with my fiance? Okay, hey guys, what's your response? Is it okay for two, and I'm assuming fiance and you know, there's a love relationship going on there. Is it okay to share an apartment? Well. Uh, the Bible says to abstain from all appearance yeah. of evil. Yeah. And if you are engaged to uh, your fiance and, uh, you know, you're not married. Now, again, see, sometimes the argument is, and I'm not sure if this is it. Well, you know, we're living together, but we're not having sexual relationship. Right. Well, you know, again, uh, it's, it's very easy to rationalize that part of it and say, well, it's all right. But again, you know, the Bible says to abstain from all appearance of evil. And I think that you should uh, probably uh, separate until you get married. Amen. And, and you know, the sad thing, and, and we as pastors, we see this so much, the, you know, the economics, well, we'll save so much money. Let me tell you something. When you take God out of the equation of Amen. your economics, you're in deep trouble. Amen. You can save all the money you want. And, and I'm not tr coming down on you, please. But well, like Dr. Gale, I'm a, the Bible's against it. The Bible says to abstain. Matter of fact, the Bible says, don't even touch a woman. If you love her that much, sir, marry her. Simple as that. Then you can live together the rest of your life. 
and I think you have to be careful too that you don't want to like you know you said Dr. Glaze well and I've heard that excuse well you know we're, we're not having sex together we're we're living together well you don't want to live with her like she's your sister that's a bad right. precedent to set I right. mean if you're engaged to be married you want this woman to be your yeah. wife you don't want to get used to a relationship when with sex not being a part of it and you're cohabitating you're setting yourself up for all kinds of strife and grief because when you do change the nature of that relationship, your pattern's been different, you know, and we are creatures of habit. So, you know, the sin issue is the worst issue right away. I mean, it's just a sin to do it. Right. Uh, and you can't expect God to bless your marriage oh, if fine. you start off yeah. by causing each other to sin. I mean, right. how, how are you going to have God bless your marriage when you've already drawn each other away from God? So, you know, move out, repent, He will forgive you, and He will bless your marriage. I'm trying to figure out what planet people are on to think they can live together in the same roof and not fall to fornication. Yeah. I mean, I don't know who has that type of willpower, but nobody's looking out and you're not going to fall. And the reason why sexual sin, I believe, also so bad, just to mention, is why you don't want to do it is because you don't want to make a, uh, a decision in the spirit realm that you're supposed to be married in the spirit and you're living in the flesh. Right. That's right. And so you can't date correctly. And so you can end up marrying for all of the wrong reasons and you see the wrong thing. So I want to encourage you, as they said, get out of that situation because then if it doesn't work, then who goes where? Yeah. You got all these issues that are going on yeah. with that. And if That's I can right. say this too, and, and let's just take the Bible for a second and put it aside and let's look at studies. Studies show that people who cohabitate, mm -hmm. you know, have less enjoyment in the relationship that there's greater chances for abuse. And there's just all kind of negativity connected with cohabitation. And those who live together before they get married are more likely to divorce afterwards. Right. Wow. It's a 75% chance yeah. the likeliness of divorce after you cohabitate, wow. have sexual relationships before, wow. before marriage. Because the idea is, let's just try this thing out. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's test drive yeah, it. Right, right, you right. can't test drive love. Yeah. You can't yeah. test drive commitment. Yeah. It's a lifelong commitment. It's not, a, it's not just a, a decision. It's a covenant that you're making. Right, right. And you can't make a covenant part time. You can't just right. casually do it. God's not mocked. God's not mocked. One of the greatest things you ever gave to a man is a woman. And uh, the whole idea of, of the sanctity of marriage, the whole idea, you're mocking God. Mm. I'm not judging you. I'm telling you, you're mocking God by what you're doing. And, and, and by doing that, you're sowing all kinds of seeds. But people don't do that. He's not do, the, he or she's not doing it for that reason. Right. But you're talking about what the results are. Right. The result. and, there, and there's going to be a crop. It's either going to be a good crop. You're so, all these seeds, they're coming back. Please take it. We're like lifeguards here. Are we judging you? Heavens no. But we're like, we're, we're, as pastors, we're trying to give you, hey, it's danger, dangerous waters. You're out too far, swimmer. Come back in. <laughs> and Dawn, we need to emphasize what you said. Marriage is a covenant. Yes. And when you think of a covenant, that covenant is not only with, you know, your partner, but that covenant is before God. And so right now, when you, when you cohabitate, you short circuit the covenant. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, you, and that damages the covenant, mm -hmm. you know, when you make it later on. So I think that that's important to remember. People, have been, been, people haven't been taught that, Pastor. I'm sorry mm -hmm. to say. Yeah. 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 A lot of people don't know that that's the case. They, they, it's casual. Marriage is not yeah. casual. No. I love what you said when we were talking about the homosexual issue. That's not marriage. No. That's no. not, God didn't define marriage that way. Marriage is a covenant between God and between you and your husband or you and your husband or your wife. Let's go over to Kurt and Kellen. Kellen, we've had some great questions today, so keep them coming. Call 877-437-0202. And you can also text Real Answers to 77453. And the next question reads, I'm not where I thought it would be financially at my point in my life and age. I've had a hard time not feeling like a failure. What do I do? <laughs> Pastors, that's such, a, yeah. that's such an honest yeah. question. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's got to be coming from a man. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah, I agree. I don't see I a agree. name on that, yeah. but that's got to be coming from a man yeah. because, and I'm sorry to say this statistic, Pastor, but the highest suicide rate is yeah. men between age 35 and 55. Mm. And I think it has a lot to do with this, this question mm -hmm. because men to get to that point in life, which is, what would be, can be considered kind of midlife. And they say, I'm not where I thought it was going to be mm -hmm. in many different areas, and I don't have any hope for life. Mm -hmm. And so they end up drugs, alcohol, mm -hmm. that midlife crisis kind of thing, or taking their own life. Pastor, what, what do you say? Well, 
you know, I, I would say that uh, you might not be where you want to be, but are you where God wants you to be? Yeah. You know, uh, Paul said that I've learned with whatever mm -hmm. I have to be content. Mm -hmm. And so uh, maybe it's just a matter of contentment. And, and, and then God will take you to the next level, but you have to be content where you're at. Mm -hmm. And then I think that once you, you know, you settle that thing with God, then God gets you financially to where you need to be. And you know, brother, I would encourage you also, don't let money define you. Please, uh, you know, I, I, I came from money. My, my dad did very well in, in life. And, and I remember many times when I first got married, we would all go out to eat and my, my dad always picked up the bill, either him or my brother-in-law. And I remember one time, I re this is right out of Bible college. I reached into my pocket to see what I had. I pulled out a button. <laughs> a button. An old button. That ain't going to cover nothing. It's got a button. But you know what? They, they never made me feel bad. I brought that upon myself. So I want to encourage right. you, don't let money define you. Let the spirit of the living God define you. Amen. And when you walk in that, in that, because he's promised to meet your every need. He's promised to meet your daily need. So you compare yourself, I'm going to pull a little Italian on you. You, you compare yourself to nobody. <laughs> nobody. nobody. Pastors? Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say that, um, I, I, and I'm not judging you because I don't know you, but I would, if, if you're not where you are financially, the first thing to do is ask the question, why? I mean, is there some sin in your life? You know, have you been lazy? Have you squandered your opportunities? Uh, did you get into a party and lifestyle, drug use or something like that? You know, you do want to look at the question, why? Why am I not where I am? And, and if, like what you said, Pete, if, if you didn't, uh, you know, if money's not your God and you didn't do anything that was in a sinful way, you may be exactly where God has you, Amen. you know? And it, we're not called to strive for uh, uh, riches versus success versus whatever. We're, strive to call, or we're called to strive to be godly, to be faithful, to be obedient. Um, and there have been many godly men, you know, men among men who are called to go and, and to, you know, be financially poor, but to be spiritually rich. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not successful. I, so I, I think you just got to look at that context. What's going on there? Well, it, it, we've, we've got a, a caller on the, on, on the phone. But before we go to Carol, I, I want to say this. Far from the financial perspective, if you're not a tither, you're never mm. going to get anything, anywhere. Yeah. Mm. You've got to give to receive. If you don't follow God's rules, if mm. you don't tithe 10%, I'm a 10% believer, mm. you need to tithe your money. If you're in, a, you, I think pastors, you yeah. tithe your way yeah. out of debt. Oh, yeah. amen. That's amen. how you tithe. So and extra. St start tithing <laughs> and you're going to see your life turn yeah. around. I'm yeah. telling you right now, you say, where do you tithe? Tithe to where God feeds you. Mm -hmm. The storehouse where God feeds you. Carol, you're on the, you're on the air with the hard questions. Pastors, what's your question? Carol? Yeah, we're talking about my husband. He can then be night drunk, slap me around, tells me I'm too stupid to, to do anything, and told me he could replace me with an old shoe anytime. So your husband is abusive, Carol. I hear you saying that he, 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 he actually is physically abusive to you. And he, yeah, he, and my little girl. He treats her like a dog. And your little girl, too? Yeah. And what, you want to know what to do about that, what the pastors would say to do about that? Well, he told me if I didn't like it, I could get a divorce. So your husband says if you don't like his abuse, you can get a divorce. Yeah. Pastors, what do you say? Well, yeah, I, I'm just going to say this. I, I think wisdom says that God would not want you to stay in an no. abusive relationship. No. As a matter of fact, the, the book of Proverbs says that you should not make friends with an angry Amen. person. And me. so it sounds, sounds like he's angry if he's doing this to you and your daughter. And the scripture says not to make friends. So that gives me the, mm. the indication that, you know, there needs to be a separation. Yeah. Well, I think also having a child in the picture, that's a sign you definitely need to get out of there. Mm. Don't allow that child to be subjected to that. That's not God's plan. It's mm. not God's will. No. And if it's been going on for a while, my question to you is why has it taken you so long right. to make a decision, especially if it's affecting your daughter, uh, you need to make a decision yeah. to move forward. Yeah. Call the police. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. what I say. Yeah. Call the police. Yeah. Report him for his yeah. abuse. If he strikes you and causes you pain, call the police. Yeah. Let the police take up your cause. You are protected. And then, and then call a lawyer. Just let's just be real about this because you have to face the fact that uh, you're in danger and your daughter's in danger yeah. and God doesn't want you to be there. 
Don't let divorce be a threat to you. That might be the best thing that ever happened to you. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Could be the best thing that ever happened to you. But I, I just say this, our, we're, we're praying for you. Yes. Amen. And we're believing God for you to have wisdom mm. that you'll be able to get out of that abusive relationship. Amen. We want your husband to come to know Jesus. He's gotta be miserable. Any man hits a woman's miserable. Mm -hmm. I mean, inside himself, he's gotta be right. miserable. So I, I, I just encourage you, mm. just give yourself to the Lord Give yourself to, uh, to faith, call the police yeah. and let, 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 uh, let them take care of the abuse and then, then find a, find a way out. Mm -hmm. Get, there's places that can help you. Mm -hmm. Call us on our prayer line, 888-665-4483. And let's pray together right now. In fact, any of you watching, if you have a prayer request, prayer need right now, we've got mm -hmm. prayer partners standing by right in the studio mm -hmm. right now who want to pray with you. 888-665-4483. And say, hey, let, will you pray for me? You know, I, f I feel sorry for the daughter because if she continues to stay under this, then then she's going to have the understanding that that one day when she picks her husband to yeah. be, that it's yeah. okay for yeah. her, her to yeah. listen. No man has a right. I don't care who no. is. No man has a right to lay hands on his wife or his daughter like that. Kurt and Kellen have a, a new text question, and we want to encourage you guys again to call eight seven seven. 437-0202. And also text real answers to 77453. And Tom texted in this question. I feel that my wife doesn't respect me because she questions every decision I make. How can I, how can I convince her that she's not submitting to me? Wow. Yeah, we were just talking about that abuse thing. That's just really makes us yeah. angry. Yeah. It makes us angry yeah. to know that. The question is, how can I convince her that if she's not submitting to me. <laughs> well, pastors, how do you do that? We're all wanting to know, how do you convince your wife to, uh, to submit? <laughs> well, he said in the beginning of the question, he said, um, you know, she questions everything that I do. And I'm going to go with Dr. Glaze in this situation with the cold counseling piece. I believe there's deeper yeah. issues there. Yeah. Um, there could be some baggage that she's carrying. There should be some things that's going on in your world. There could be some things that are um, not correct in your marriage and how you guys are going about things. Uh, the Bible, one thing that is important, though, if the woman is watching right now, Every man likes to be honored. That's right. The greatest way to get my attention, my, that my wife can get my attention or that God can get my attention is for my wife to go silent. Amen. When she gets silent, God begins to speak. Yep, yep. And it's just something about that. So if you're watching, lady, the greatest thing you can do for your husband is to honor him. That's right. And the only thing you can do as a man, you can't make her follow you. You can't. That's All you can do is right. be the best right. biblical leader, find yeah. out what it means to be a husband, right. be the best you can be, mm -hmm. and leave the results up to the Lord. And, and you know, uh, and I'll just say this real quick. Uh, forced submission is no submission. That's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, and I think his question was, how do I convince my yeah. wife to, and I just pick right up on what you were saying, Jay. You're not called to convince her to submit to you. The Bible calls her wives submit. The command is to the wife, wives submit. Even as the command is to the husband's love, wives submit. So God has called her. She's responsible to do that submission. You want to be the, the serving leader, the kind of leader where she would want to submit to you. And again, I don't right. know all the picture there. I mean, you, you may be driving her away and causing her not to want to submit because of the way you're speaking to her or treating her. You may not realize it, but you know, that's where counseling again comes into the picture that if, if you, know, you get a sort of a third neutral party, somebody who's skilled, somebody who has experience, they may point out things yeah. to you that are, that are reasons why she doesn't want to submit to you. And you know, we live in a society and, and I'm seeing this in premarital counseling that I'm doing. Uh, let me say this right, equalitarian where there's no headship, mm. that both are equal. Mm. And, you know, I, I'm wondering if that's a little bit of this going on here uh, with the lady. You know, maybe she feels that, you know, I'm, I'm, not just, I'm an equal partner well, with you. Well, we're, you know, our culture is all, all kind of all wacky. Messed up we're all wacky. <laughs> I wrote a chapter called the Healthy Relationships, chapter 21 in this book. I want you to have a copy of it for yourself. We're gonna give it to you for free because we care about you. Here's how, get, here's how you can get your copy. How do I save my marriage? What are signs of addiction? Does God love me? Can I be healed? In today's world, it's easy to look for answers, but where do you find the truth? Well, here at Cornerstone, we believe that real answers for all of life's questions come from God's Word. We care about you and want to help you find what you're looking for. 
And as our gift to you, we would love to send you God's answers for real life. Cornerstone President Don Black's book covers 30 topics from depression to finances to addiction to marriage. Each chapter gives answers from the Bible on whatever you may be facing. So call today or go online for your free copy of God's Answers for Real Life. It will bless you and help you find the abundant life that Jesus promises. Well, you know, Paul, Apostle Paul said, he compared our lives to a race. He said, we run the race to win. Now, you know about winning. <laughs> you know about winning. And he, he finished strong. And later on, he wrote, he said, I finished the course. You know, I fought the fight. Mm -hmm. I fought the fight. How do, we, uh, how do we finish strong, Coach? You know, for me, um, I just try to move daily in the spirit and the understanding that there are awesome opportunities and blessings for me and uh, to share with people, to interact with people um, that, you know, some, something that's seemingly a challenge is really an opportunity. Um, I just try to embrace all of that. Um, I try to do it in a very upfront and open and transparent way. Um, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to fall sh short. We all are. Mm -hmm. uh, we're men. Um, but I just try to move in that spirit to me, um, being open to the possibilities that are awesome things that God's going to do in my life today is winning today for me. Men do have that tendency to roll up their sleeves and fix things. And I think God built that in us. Because think of it, when there was a problem in the universe, what did God do? He rolled up his sleeves and he fixed things. Mm -hmm. And we're created in the image of God. So that piece of it is a good thing. But in God's case, he doesn't need anybody's assistance. What we forget that is in our case, we need God's assistance. When you let God work through you, and again, God's doing doesn't mean we watch. It means we know our spot. We don't get outside of our lane. When you let God work through you, the results are so awesome, you want more of that. You get a taste for that. So that the further you go, uh, letting God hold the reins, I think it becomes easier and easier because you know it's got to produce something you can celebrate. That's right. You've got to get your eyes off of who you are outside of who Christ called you to be, outside of the identity that you have in Him. When men try to find their value and their worth externally, that's true for men or women, mm -hmm. you're in an impossible trap because that value, that worth cannot come externally through success or have it diminished by failure. Mm -hmm. And so when your value and your worth is determined by what God was willing to purchase you with, the blood of His Son. Mm -hmm. So my value is who God says I am, the willingness of what He was willing to purchase me with, not silver or gold or anything corruptible, but the blood of His Son. Mm -hmm. So my value isn't based on whether I succeed or fail. Mm -hmm. My value to God isn't, in fact, God's love for me has nothing to do with what I do for Him or for that matter, even against Him. It's who He is. And I think the, the way is to just follow hard after Jesus. You know, there's a prayer that I pray for me and all the men that I come in contact with. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that God would cause me to love Him deeply, to follow Him closely, and to know Him intimately. You know, you look at David and as a man after God's own heart. I, I've often pondered, what made David a man after God's own heart? You know, he had many failures. He had many victories. Uh, and there were so many men of integrity in the Bible, but it was David that God pointed out as a man after his own heart. And after studying the, the Psalms over and over again and studying his life, I don't know if this is right, but it, it, comes, it, it came to me that David's passion for God, Mm -hmm. His passion for God's Word, His passion for God's glory, His passion to be in God's presence. Mm -hmm. Those are the things. So for us to finish strong, we can't let up. You know, we got to train. You know, we got to, you know, I love because Paul uses, the Apostle Paul uses training. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't shadow box. He says, I don't uh, punch to the air. I, you know, I beat my body and then my, make it my slave. And I think that's, I, I love that. I mean, mm -hmm. I love that analogy because I know what it's like to train hard. I know what it's like to push. And so now uh, all the years of football and 
Chuck, Chuck Nolan making us run sprints and lift weights and practice uh, hard every day, uh, training camps that were brutal. Well, guess what? God calls us to train spiritually the same way. Train spiritually the same way. We got to work hard so that we can finish strong. You know, just as our Hard Questions program does every week, I'm going to wrap up this show with a scripture. And here, here's the word. Since we are surrounded with such a great cloud of witnesses, mm. let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance Amen. the race that is set before us. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Now, as we do pastors on our regular program, we have our rapid, our rapid uh, fire round. Let's do that right now. You just got a few seconds. How do you finish the race strong, pastor? I think we have a perfect biblical example when the apostle Paul, I have fought a good fight. Mm -hmm. I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. And when he says, I have fought a good fight, that doesn't mean he put on boxing gloves and went out and, and tried to box. But the word there is actually agonizomai, which means to agonize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so Paul said that, you know, man, there was times that I was beat down and I agonized and I stayed in the race. Mm -hmm. That there'll be times that we feel beat down in the family. There'll be times that we feel beat down in society, but we got to suck it up, agonize and keep on going. Good word, mm -hmm. brother. Amen. Good word. I would say um, Ephesians 6, 10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And the way in which we walk in the strength and might of the Lord, I mean, I look to Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have success. We've got to be in God's word. That's the source of our strength. God's spirit, God using his word in us to convict us, to lead us, to teach us and, and to keep us. And, and that's the way we do it. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. You do that, everything you put your hand to do, you will prosper. You will finish strong. When Adam sinned in the garden, he said, you'll work by the sweat of your brow. Part of the curse is being separated from the Father. The greatest thing that any man can do is pray. Be a man of prayer. Stay Amen. connected to Father, and then you won't carry your own weight. You'll work in His strength, and you can finish your race strong. Pastors, you guys always are amazing to me. I want to thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming and doing this live show. This is fun. This is great. It's been fun to do. do it thank you. For, <laughs> thank you for joining us in this program. Thank you to the brothers for being here mm -hmm. and and bringing life to us. We we appreciate. Your, your, your partnership with us, all of your Cornerstone partners. Let me just say this last word. You've got to identify who you are. What, what defines you? What defines you? Man, brother, what defines you? You define yourself. Find your, your true worth in the word Amen. and then live it out. Amen. Man up. Amen. It's time to stand up, man up, Amen. and be who you are called to be. Be the man God has created you to be. We'll see you on our next Hard questions.